Hi, I'm Reggie Turner. I'm here with Jim Miller and Terrence Moore. Flipside starts right now. Welcome to the show. Tonight we're joined again by Senator Paul Corderman. Paul, thank you for being with us. Thank you. I appreciate Two weeks that in a row, that's amazing. <laughs> wow. And these guys didn't even change clothes. <laughs> Hardest working mini show business. <laughs> Stay till the job's done. That's, that's right. it. Paul, let's talk a bit about the capital budget and, and how it relates to our community. But starting it out, talk to us about how the capital budget works. Sure. So, start at the beginning, like you said. So, the capital budget and the operating budget, quite frankly, both budgets, uh, mm -hmm. are first put out by the governor. Right. So that is put out uh, at the beginning of the, of the session. What I tell folks all the time, regardless of which budget you're talking about, but more so the capital budget, because that's kind of the one where most people are interested in, because it's a lot of the, mm -hmm. you know, the capital infrastructure, the one-time right. monies for a different variety of projects and, and things of that nature. Um, it is a living document. It is put out by the governor, but it is alive until it passes. And during that time, what I mean by that is it goes from the governor's desk to it alternates years um, but this year it went to the house first the house has an opportunity to go in to add change move things around um, and then once they do their thing then it comes over to the senate the same thing happens and then sometimes it goes back to a conference committee at the last minute until it gets passed this year it got passed oh it might have been signed out. It was either signed out of the day. It was it was, it was late it this was year. Late, right? yes. It was very late as far as the traditional timeline. It's always generally towards the end of session, but usually within the last week or two, not the last day or two. Um, but it's a living document where those changes can happen. So, again, capital budget comes out. The governor has put something in there, or maybe didn't put something in there, and, and, a, and a particular organization may be excited or disappointed. I told me all the time, I was like, well, hold on. I was like. We still got ways to go here. We still got 90 days. There's still multiple opportunities between the House and the Senate. Uh, you know, I, I'm obviously in the Senate. I serve on the Budget and Taxation Committee. I actually serve on the Capital Budget Subcommittee. Um, so I'm one of seven senators in the state that are on the Capital Budget. Um, so that gives our office the opportunity uh, to be involved uh, in those discussions for not just capital projects throughout the state, but most specifically to our community. Um, and so that, I think that kind of gives you an overview of kind of how that you know, works through, and then it ultimately is passed at the end, and then that is the capital budget at the end of the session, what has been passed with those changes. Are those all, does that all come from tax dollars? So the capital budget is, um, like, like most capital budgets, it is leveraging debt service. Okay. Um, so the state of Maryland goes out and they sell bonds to the tune of about a billion dollars to create the capital budget. Um, you know, that debt service is paid with tax dollars, mm -hmm. yes. Um, but they, they, they generate, you know, those, that revenue through, uh, bonding capabilities. So, not to be not to be stupid here, but I'm assuming the cost of those go have gone up, given the interest rates have gone up. Some of that has gone up, and but some of them also have fallen off. You know, depending on you know what the previous capital budgets were uh, and things like that. But yes, to your basic point, yes, interest rates have gone up. So the the years where the rates were low, and sometimes you can borrow a little bit more. Maybe you're not borrowing as much right. this time. But but generally, for what I have seen in, in my tenure there. It's around about a billion dollars is what the capital budget has been um, you know, borrowed each year. Now, what we have seen in the past couple of years with uh, the influx of uh, revenues through a lot of, as we call it, the COVID money through the, the federal government, things of that nature, uh, they were able to take a lot of capital projects, move them over to PAYGO through the operating budget because you had an abundance of revenue in the operating budget. And they actually even did that this year with some, with some things because there was still Last year was an unprecedented amount of money, uh, capital products that were in there. Right. Um, not just from what was borrowed, but which is money they just put straight into the capital because they, the, they had the cash. Um, it was about, I think, four or five billion dollars last year. Wow. This year was about three. Still, historically unprecedented, but when you, when you stack it up against last year's, a, a little bit less. But what you're able to do with a lot of this capital things, because you had that money and you could pay it right away, um, our public safety training center, we were fortunate enough to get two point uh, two five was originally in the governor's capital budget, but it eventually got moved to Pago, to Pago uh, through the operating. At the end of the day, the entity's still getting the money, so it you know it doesn't matter on that end. Uh -huh. But it's just the structure of the budget and how you can move money around to a certain point. So when you have those 
you know, more, uh, uh, you know, those years with, with greater revenue, you have that ability. When you have those more lean years, obviously you don't have that ability, and it's really what you're going to borrow. And I can attest to the pay go was very simple. Mm -hmm. It was a more streamlined process <clears throat> of getting the monies directly for. Yeah, you see a lot of with the projects. supplemental budgets because yeah. the supplemental budgets come out are usually because there are additional funds, revenues generally come out, projections come out during the session. Uh, whether this year we had a write down, uh, the last couple years we had increased revenues, so you had uh, more money available in supplemental budgets. This year, not as much. Um, so that, that's kind of. Can you share, um, there was a change on how legislators can impact the budget mm -hmm. um, last year, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. How did that go this year? So I think the, the greatest example of that was when the governor put out, so let me back up a second. So what changed, uh, it was on the ballot probably about two years ago, that allows the General Assembly the ability to change things you know, in the budget. Before the governor kind of set the budget, that was what it was. Um, this is mostly an operating budget. What changed is now the General Assembly can go in there and move things around. The greatest example that uh, you saw was when the governor put the budget out, he had $500 million set aside for transportation and $500 million set aside for education, so a billion dollars. The $500 million for education was going to go to Kerwin because they're you know, continually having to increase that funding based over the, the revenues that are needed to support that over the next couple of years. The $500 million that were for transportation the governor's committed to, to putting that towards transportation, but I think this was, was uh, uh, really um, a symptom of they just came in, they knew they wanted to put some money in transportation, but they hadn't really fine-tuned exactly what that was going to look like, um, and so they weren't ready yet to move on that. And so, again, this was through a collaborative, I think, effort between you know, the, the executive branch and the leaders of the General Assembly, but they moved that money. They took that 500 for transportation, they moved, I have to go back and check, they either moved 300 or 400 million over to education. That's what it was. The House moved, they changed it to 400 was going to go over to education, so it would be 900 to education, and just 100 left for transportation, and then the Senate made it, changed it, and the House agreed to it to 300, 200. Basically, they took that money, and it was a prime example of you wouldn't have had that ability to do that in the past. Um, but the General Assembly did it this year, and they said, all right, Governor, we're going to take your 500 million, we're going to take 300 of that, and we're putting that to education, and then you can keep 200. So not an increase, more of an allocation. More of an allocation, yep. 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 So one of the things that surprised me way back when, and I'll just bring it up, I understand it at this point, but maybe our viewers don't, mm -hmm. is that when you put this capital budget together and you have projects that cross fiscal years, mm -hmm. there's a notion, there's a process whereby the amount of money to that is automatically increased. Can you talk about that? Well, automatic is, a, is, a, is I don't know, well, so let me back up a second. So the Maryland Theater. I think is a great example of that. So Governor Hogan came to the Maryland Theater and he committed seven, eight, nine million dollars, where the number was, spread out over multiple years. It was like 2.25 over three or four years. And that's not necessarily automatic um, because, again, until it's in the budget each fiscal year and approved, it's not automatic. Now, that project we were fortunate enough because the governor had made that commitment. He went and put it in the budget each year when the budget was released from his office. Generally, things that you see the governor put in, uh, regardless of party, and a capital budget, they generally, they don't really move. Um, that other example I used, that was more of an operating, you know, uh, budget money thing that they had going on. But the, um, the theater was an example that, on the flip side, no pun intended, you saw this year where you had, uh, locally, the town of Smithsburg, last year it had a $3 million pre-authorization. They got a million dollars last year for some infrastructure improvements in the town with a $3 million pre-authorization for this coming year, or the session just passed. Well, when the budget came out from the governor, that $3 million, even though it was pre-authorized, was not in there. And so that, that money never materialized. Um, the museum right now is undergoing a three-year uh, commitment, so to speak. They got 1.125 the first year with a pre-authorization over the next uh, two years. The governor did honor that one when he put it out when it came out. So again, the automatic, it's not automatic. But, but what, what I was talking about, if, if something is approved the next year, assuming mm -hmm. it stays in the budget, sure. the number actually changes to reflect cost increases. Is that true? No. Okay. No. I misunderstood that then. So, I mean... How about well, the field house? That, how, what, did, what happened with that? Wasn't that an increase? So the, fi so the field house did get increased. So good example there. So the field house last year had a million dollars uh, that was approved with a $2 million pre-authorization for this year. 
The governor put the budget out. He put it in the $2 million. He, he honored that pre-authorization. As it then went through the House and the Senate, uh, on the House side, with some of the uh, conversations that Delegate Grossman had uh, on her side, uh, got a million dollars that was added to it. Um, so that's how it became three million. Gotcha. So the numbers can change, but they're not automatic. They don't automatically change because of inflation. But they okay. can change. Inflation may be the reason why it changed, but it's not automatic. Okay. All right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul, when we we sat down and, and talked in your office early in session. Um, the biggest thing you were sweating about was the I-81 money. Mm -hmm. um, talk, talk about that initiative and, and the process and where we are now. So when we talk about the I-81 money, that was kind of one of the last things that Governor Hogan did on his way out the door. Uh, he allocated about $100 million in the uh, Consolidated Transportation Plan. It's called the CTP, which is basically the capital budget of MDOT, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of state highways uh, for phase two of 81. Um, again, as we talk about these other things, whether it's the capital budget, the operating budget, the CTP is part of the budget. Um, so it can be, it is open to changes as well during that legislative session. And so there was concern um, that again, look, we are a small rural western you know, Maryland county. There, and you talk about, you know, administration's coming in, wants to do a lot of transportation type things we talked about. Um, you know, on my side of the aisle, I, I am a supporter of mass transit and some of those mass transit opportunities. Um, however, they, they carry a price tag to them. Um, the, the new administration seems to be committed, at least they have said publicly, uh, about revitalizing the red line uh, in, in Baltimore, which is the east-west corridor of their, of their light rail. The well, last time they were talking about doing it, it's, it's multiple billions with a B. And so as you're looking around the state, of where you're gonna get this money, I mean, there's only so much money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's the concern of, you know, would that money be reallocated uh, to a project like that or some other project maybe in one of the, in the 95 corridor. Um, fortunately, uh, that money was preserved. Um, I think that was a commitment by a variety of individuals. I think it was a great example of regardless of politics or uh, party, of people collaborating in this part of the state. Uh, Congressman Trone uh, was very supportive of it. He and I had multiple conversations uh, in regard to that. I know he reached out specifically to the governor's office. I spoke directly with the governor one-on-one -on -one, one of the first days I met him about that. I know Delegate Grossman did the same. Um, so I think it was a good collaborative effort of how important that is. But yeah, there, there was concern. And there's still concern going forward as far as we still need to get phase three and phase four done mm -hmm. of how do we get that funding. Again, regardless of what, you're always competing. Whatever the project may be, whether it's a, you know, a museum or a highway or whatever it may be, you're always competing with some other entity or some other part of the state uh, for funding. So, but it was a big win for our community. Yeah, and I think it's hard to celebrate the manufacturing that's coming to this area mm -hmm. and not support it with the infrastructure mm -hmm. of expanding um, I-81. Yeah, no, I think it's a great example. I mean, as we have that, 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 that explosion of e-commerce, um, 81 is that's because of it, the 8170. Mm -hmm. Now that being said, I'm gonna throw something here on the side. Banning truck stops in Washington County, don't know about that was the best idea when we talk about we have so of the of the, the primary interstates in the state of Maryland, we have two of the six primary interstates, 70 to 81. Um, and then we've gone and made the decision here <coughs> locally to ban truck stops on one of the heaviest corridors in our state in the Northeast where we have an explosion of again of logistical space and things of that nature but that's probably a conversation for another day <laughs> <laughs> that might be a show in i don't think you're <laughs> the only one that's come to that yeah. conclusion though for sure there's a concern on the i-81 piece mm -hmm. that uh, there's that it's going to be money wasted at some level because the fact that at pennsylvania line it goes mm -hmm. back to two lanes mm -hmm. thoughts on that I, well i think it's um the greatest example you go look at is West Virginia. I mean, mm -hmm. how many lanes is it in West Virginia? Three. Yeah. Yeah. And what are we doing in Maryland now? Yeah. Yep. We're expanding. I think it, it will come. Yeah. I think Pennsylvania's excuse right now is like, well, it's only two lanes in Maryland, so why do we got to do it? Well, I, I, the other thing is, I think that t to your point of the Interstate 8170 interchange, mm -hmm. I think that's where a lot of the traffic is. Sure. So it, it's not going to impact necessarily going into Pennsylvania. It's going to mm -hmm. impact coming out of West Virginia, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's going to com impact coming out of Pennsylvania, which is a good thing. I think you'll see a lot in Pennsylvania 281 because I think that that same, uh, you know, logistical, um, <coughs> you know, expansion that we've seen here in, in our county with the 7081 corridor, 
go up to Franklin County. You know, go up 81, you see the same thing up there. Absolutely. We have some of the same, I mean, North Point, which is which built the, uh, uh, you know, facilities out on Basil Boulevard, and they're building, you know, two more out on 40. They have multiple facilities on 81 up in Franklin County. So I think, to, to answer your question, I think Pennsylvania will come along. I think it's just, they're just using it as the sheer excuse of, well, it's two lanes coming into it, well, you know, build it and they will come. I think if you get three lane up the Pennsylvania line, you'll see Pennsylvania move forward as well, is my opinion. And the longer it takes us to start, mm -hmm. the longer it's going to take to completion because I remember that. And the more it's going to cost. Right, <laughs> right. And I remember that the construction in West, in West Virginia was. Mm -hmm. Took a long what, time. Four, five yeah. years maybe? Well, do you remember they just finished the, uh, the interchange at 270 that it was just an interchange project mm -hmm. and really from a mileage perspective is less than we're talking about here. And how long were they working down there? Yeah. I mean, road projects, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to speak ill of our, of our friends in the roads departments no. and the engineers and all the great folks that do that work, but man, it is expensive. It's expensive and it's time consuming. I mean, we're talking a yeah. hundred million dollars yes. for a stretch of road that's about two or three miles, if right. that. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just a lot that goes into it. And I'm not saying the number's not right and it is what it is and that's just what it is, but it is a lot of money and it ain't going to get any cheaper. And the cost to our economy, right? right. You know, this country stops if trucking stops. Yes, it does. And if we start bottlenecking trucking, you're adding hours or days into a commute for a truck driver. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. an impact economically to the businesses, which ultimately turns prices that goes back to the customers. So as I said, the sooner, the better. You, you know, the other thing is, is that, you know, when Governor uh, Moore was here roughly three weeks ago, you know, I, you, know you talked about two things, mm -hmm. manufacturing mm -hmm. and transportation. Mm -hmm. So. Ironically, he was being interviewed for a documentary mm -hmm. about the house on Johnson Street, but it expands on our manufacturing economy, mm -hmm. what's happened to it, and where is where is the state of it now. He was mm -hmm. he was being interviewed about that, but then also he visited Volvo, mm -hmm. um, and then there's some lobbying going on to see if the I-81 project can be sped up. Mm -hmm. Do you have any any hope that that process can be moved? So I, I think it's funny you, you mentioned Volvo because as Terrence was talking about, you know, the, the economics uh, and how that works, Volvo has a stat and they've put it out there before. When 81 shuts down, they lose like $100,000 an hour or something. It's, it's some absurd number that they lose because they can't receive things, they can't send things out, it puts delays on their orders of going out. I mean, it is a major impact. So I think to your point, uh, probably, uh, you know, I mean, not just the governor, I mean, the president was at Volvo you right. know, not too long ago. Mm -hmm. They recognize the importance of that facility, not just in our region, uh, you know, locally, but statewide and in the Northeast. I mean, Volvo is the last uh, manufacturer of, of vehicles, of some type of vehicle in our state. Um, and they are one of the leaders of some electrification yes. things with, with truck. And so I think that really got the attention of the administration also. Because uh, that fits towards the mandate it does. Of towards moving towards EV vehicles. Right. In Which is an interesting thing because it's 2035. I think yeah. they want to have mandate that there will be no more uh, gas powered vehicles sold in the state of Maryland. Um, <laughs> you know, interesting enough, um, you know, I spoke before in another segment about the Gonzalez poll that came out yesterday. Um, majority of Marylanders don't support that. Right. You know, there's over 60%. They're not, they're not really down with that. And I think what it is is, look, I think at the end of the day, people want to do what's right for the environment. You know, I think we all want to see it someday we will get there, but you got to be able to get there first. But we don't have the infrastructure we yet don't. to support that as far as the electrification of not just, forget about charging stations and, and the type of vehicles, the grid. I mean, you talk to anyone that knows about electricity in this country and the grid and, you know, how fragile that is. Um, that's a huge, massive undertaking of infrastructure in our, in our country, which we have to do. Don't get me wrong. Might be a little too aggressive by 2035. Yeah. My and then power goes out once a month at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you're not going to sell, and then, then you get into this whole conversation of, all right, so Maryland has, has put that out. So they've planted that flag by 2035. We're not going to sell any more gas-powered vehicles. Well, what, who do we follow? We follow California. Um, well, the quickest and easiest you know, counterpoint to that is going to be, well, especially where we live, well, I'm just going to go to West Virginia and buy a car. I'll go to right. Pennsylvania or right. right. whatever. So until you get buy-in, I really think that has to be a conversation on a national level. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise you start pitting yourself against other jurisdictions. Um, and it's a similar conversation we have when we talk about minimum wage, we talk about paid leave, we talk about things in the business community because they are state issues, don't get me wrong. Um, but you see that, you know, that, that imbalance that you can create with your neighboring jurisdictions. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Do you see that some of that competing for the billions of dollars of infrastructure bill that came in mm -hmm. when, the new pres when President Biden came into mm -hmm. office? 
and, and you know he tied it a lot to chips mm -hmm. and electric cars, mm -hmm. you know, electric vehicles. So as a state, don't you want to compete for some of those dollars? Yeah, no, I think you absolutely want to compete. And I think we absolutely need to be working towards that goal. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think, how realistic is the goal? That's right. my you know point. What I, mean? um, I don't think anyone, again, I don't think regardless of well, what your party affiliation or ideology is, would agree that society as we move forward, look, 100 years ago, we didn't have gas powered vehicles or whenever the vehicle was created. You know what I mean? Back in the horse and buggy days. So I think electric is going to be the way of the future. When are we going to get there? And that's, that's it's an it's a interesting question because you want to set goals, you want to set aggressive goals to create that, that momentum and that movement to try to hit that goal. But at the same time, if it's completely unrealistic, then it's what are you, what are you doing? Well, but the other consideration too is that this, this administration will not be there mm -hmm. to be held accountable either way That's true. when well, we get to yes. 2035. State or national, they all make promises down right. the road when they're not going to be there that they're they do. not going to And again, be these are goals and those things can always be changed <laughs> and, and things of that, that nature. But um, it's a very, it's a, look, it's a, it's a bold position to take. Uh, uh, you know, one that that administration has, has taken. And you know we'll see how it plays out over the next dozen years. We but will see. I've it has been shown right now, today, a majority of mail-owners, they're, they're not quite there yet. Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm all for it if we can make it happen. I just sure. don't see it. I don't see it. Well, it's not it just the things we talked about about the infrastructure and the grid. Just look at the pure cost of a vehicle. Well, the I cost mean, of a vehicle. Electric vehicle is yeah. fifteen to twenty thousand dollars more mm -hmm. than right. a, than a gas vehicle right now. And so then you, you get into the the social economical challenges of, of individuals and and we don't have enough lithium for the batteries. Well, right that's now. Yeah. Exactly. that's where I was lithium. going. Is all of the pieces yeah. and parts that you need. Right. right. You know, there's the, so much the mining and stuff that you need to do to get right. these pieces and parts. And then you've got the disposal of these batteries mm -hmm. once they're no longer in service, which I'm told is a is an environmental nightmare potentially unless you do it the right way. Yeah. And on top of that, the automobile when it took over for the horse didn't have to fight a trillion dollar oil business. This is true. <laughs> yeah. You're right. You're right. <laughs> so um, I, I think there's going to be some that's pushback a fair, that's there a fair as well. Point. That's a fair point. <laughs> so one of the things in in this discussions of the capital budget mm -hmm. clearly are capital budget items that are going to sure. municipalities to going to other governmental agencies. There's also a lot of things like the museum, like mm -hmm. others that are funding. How does the state ensure transparency and accountability for the funds that they distribute mm -hmm. to, you know, whether it's the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts, and I'm not suggesting well, sure. anything. Well, the entity. Right. The entity. How mm -hmm. do you assure that the funds go where they are supposed to go? Mm -hmm. So I think individuals that have been involved in that process could probably speak to it even better than I do. It is a it is a <laughs> very cumbersome process. I tell me all the time, <laughs> if the uh, what's used the public safety training center, you know, got 2.25, the state of Maryland just doesn't stroke a check for 2.25 and hand it over to the county commissioner to say, go build you yourself go. a training center or add a wing to it or whatever it is you want to do to it. There is a process. I mean, that, that, that is government at its finest, <laughs> I say it sarcastically, bureaucracy. of the <laughs> levels of bureaucracy, the levels of checks and balances and red tape. And a lot of it's handled, mo most of the time, a lot of it's handled on reimbursement. Like you have to put the money out yes. Yes. to do the project to then be able to produce said receipts and invoices and, and what have you of, that's how you get the money back. All right, go back to the Maryland Theater. You know, we talked about that earlier as far as they get their money spread out. Well, if we remember, the county commissioners forward funded that money to be able to pay for the construction because the way that process works over those four years, one, it would take four years to get all the money and then you typically only get the money on a reimbursement process. So you'd either have to, uh, or something that large, partner with maybe a local bank or a county government, which what they did. So they got the government to kind of act as the bank. The county commissioners act as the bank, gave them the money up front. And then as the monies came in, the receipts were already ge generated, the invoices were there from the contractors that did the work. And then that money went back into the into, into government. Yeah, so. but I got to tell you, as a taxpayer, mm -hmm. as much as I am against bureaucracy, I'm okay with that one because yeah. we want that money to no, go you, where it's you supposed want, to go. Exactly. We yeah. don't want it to end up in pockets that it's not supposed I to think, be. I uh, think I would hope that anyone who's watching out there, if you're going to take away anything, as you said earlier, the state of Maryland is not writing checks <laughs> and handing them out <laughs> to these entities in this town or any other town in the state of Maryland. That's just that's just how it works. Yeah. Um, well. And you have a pretty significant track record this last this mm -hmm. last session of 
getting of helping to get some money for our community. Can we take a break and then come back and talk about that, Reggie? Absolutely, we sure can. I don't mean to take over your responsibilities, but that's okay. Cronkite's okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, stay with us. We'll have more with Senator Paul Corderman after the break. Welcome back to the show. Senator Corderman, thank you for staying with us. We've been talking about the capital budget. We've been talking about the I-81 expansion and all the facets of that. Now let's talk about some of the wins uh, in the capital budget. There was a significant amount of dollars that came to our community. I know that it is a fight for these dollars mm -hmm. uh, every session. Uh, let, let's kind of run through the list of, of some of the big wins there. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, first and foremost, the, the, the Public Safety Training Center. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. So as many are aware in our community that the county built a public safety training center, you know, just south of town. Um, it has multiple um, levels to it of expansion they want to do. Um, that request came from the county to, to help them move towards their next, you know, expansion opportunity of that. Um, and again, said it a couple of times, regardless of politics, I think we can all agree we want our public safety individuals to be supported. Um, and so, yeah, so that was a significant piece. It was about two point. 2.2? 2.5, yeah. 2.5, yep. 2.25, right? Correct. Yeah. 2 million, 250,000. So that serves fire, rescue, police. What all, what all does that serve? I think all, all the above. So have you had an opportunity to be down there? I have or, not. Have mm -hmm. Beautiful facility. I don't know if you guys have been down yes, there or not. They've, they've had a couple different things there. Uh, but to exactly your point, it's, it's a support training center that all the different entities uh, in the county can utilize um, for different training opportunities. Uh, I believe they're going to put a burn building down there uh, as well for the fire department. Uh, there's only one burn building right now. It's historically, it's always been the city of Hagerstown. Right. Um, I don't think the, they're looking to put one in the training center. Um, I can't. I don't want to speak to all the specifics because someone within that facility would know more of all the different you know expansion opportunities they're looking to do. But the crux of it is for EMS, police, fire, uh, for the necessary training abilities for them to have that. You know, and in this in this environment where. Uh, training of our public safety officials mm -hmm. is top of the news sure. a lot. I think this is a great investment for our county. Mm -hmm. Does it tie into the high school public safety program? The training center? I'm, I can't speak to that if they have any um, collaboration with the high schools or I would imagine they probably do with especially with the, uh, the technical high school right. that has the, has the program. Um, you know, I don't want to go out of limb, but I would imagine there's probably some sort of collaboration there between the two. Um, if there isn't, there definitely should be. So <laughs> does this type yes. of facility exist in other, in other counties? Yeah, a lot of communities have a public okay. safety training center. Mm -hmm. okay. But I brought up the high school because we become a kind of a, a, a birthing place for public safety across mm -hmm. the state at one point in time. Even you know, when, I, when I was in leadership and we went to the, the high school mm -hmm. to understand that we're training kids right here in, in Washington County to be in CSI to be in the FBI, mm -hmm. you know, and to, and to be in public safety across the country, mm -hmm. you know, um, and to tie it to a training facility at, at that um, just kind of levels us up in a certain way that um, once again turns some attention back to Washington County that I, I don't think a lot of people recognize. I know, I didn't even know. Sure. And I drove by the school for years before I even knew what it was. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other thing that's interesting about Washington County specifically, uh, and specifically our former sheriff, Sheriff Mullendore, um, I don't go to Annapolis a lot, but for whatever reason, whenever I was there, he seemed to be there presenting mm -hmm. something, and we seemed to be the uh, you know the, the the change agent for some of those things, whether it was uh, remote reporting or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. There are there are a lot of things that have come out of Washington County in terms of public safety that have been mirrored across the state. Yeah, Sheriff Mullendore was was a obviously a tremendous asset to our community. Still is. Um, you know, he had some leadership roles within the Chiefs and Sheriffs Association. Uh, but I got to tip my hat to the new sheriff, Sheriff Albert, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, he came down to Annapolis on multiple, multiple times. I saw him there, uh, being involved as well. So um, I think we have, you know, a, a good, you know, we've had a good group of uh, individuals in the past, and, and also in the future. And continue, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I would agree. Uh, next item, we, and we've talked about this a little bit already. The Hagerstown Field House mm -hmm. received about it was a one million in the budget last year. Mm -hmm. There was two pre-authorized. Another million was added to that. Um, so three million mm -hmm. is coming towards that project. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know where that project stands right now? That would be a better question probably for some folks in the city of Hagerstown. I know they're still gathering some, some funding uh, to complete that project. Um, I, you know, my last conversation with them, um, you know, that project still sat around in the low 20 some million dollars for the entire project. 
Um, and so I think, again, I don't want to speak for them, but I think there's, they're looking at different opportunities as far as, you know, their partnership with uh, um, the consulting company who would be the management company of what opportunities may be there with them, uh, any particular, you know, debt service they can take out themselves. But again, that would probably be a better question for the city, so I don't want to speak for them. Gotcha. Um, next on the list, we had the, uh, the Museum of Fine Arts mm -hmm. and their expansion. Yeah, so the museum, uh, that started last year. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, conversation we had with them uh, in regards to, they bought the uh, the, Bach Oil, the old Bach Oil building next mm -hmm. to the museum, so they're looking to expand, uh, create a art campus. Um, <coughs> so uh, it's about a $3 million commitment, um, $3.5 million, I think it is, spread out over three years. Uh, the first year was funded, the second year was funded. So again, as we talked about before, Things aren't automatic, so and I, I you know, had that conversation with um, with the art director here not too long ago. Of like we're gonna we're gonna push, you know, to, to get that last year of funding, but don't don't start writing the checks yet because, right. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah. So. I think it's probably one of the most unsung projects that are happening in the community mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, I think you're right, and I also think, frankly, you know, the museum as a whole. I mean, what a resource that mm -hmm. we have, and you look at our arts and entertainment, and I, we have an arts and entertainment district downtown, mm -hmm. but. Even beyond that, we have so many. Uh, you want to know why people want to move here? It's mm -hmm. not just the fact that it's there's farmland and sure. a great quality of life. We have some of these big city, the Maryland Symphony, the mm -hmm. Washington, the, the the Museum of Fine Arts, the Maryland Theater. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Go into the Washington County Arts Council and see the artists that are in this community developing pieces. You want a unique gift? Mm -hmm. Just walk in there and. The uh, you know, you're, no chance you're going to find it anywhere else. You know, I think sometimes our community underappreciates because we're so close to it. Um, <coughs> but, you know, last year I took, um, you know, a group of Leadership Maryland mm -hmm. participants and, and we, we visited the, you know, the Maryland Theater and uh, the Museum of mm -hmm. Fine Arts. And they were, they were blown away by sure. these assets. And, you know, some of them were, were business owners and they were looking for for ways to engage our community in Western Maryland and, and possibly partner and do business here. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it, that, that's a huge win for us. And But like you said, they have to hold tight because they still have to fight for those additional yeah, dollars. Yeah, and, and they're going through stuff. an additional, that was kind of the start of their capital campaign. Mm -hmm. I think their whole project is around, it's uh, over 10, uh, no, it's it's like it's like 15 or 18 or something right, like okay. that. It's, it's a decent sized number. Um, but that, I think that's a good example of you get some state dollars invested in it, kind of kicks off that campaign, gets that enthusiasm going. Yep. They'll go to some of you know, the private side as well. They'll go through their other grant opportunities, things of that nature. Um, but I think back to all the points that are made here, of particularly to Jim, when you talk about the museum, and, and Reggie, you hit on it too with, with the folks came from leadership. Of, and that, that's where I think it's, it's my job and our fellow delegate and senator jobs when we go downstate about educating people in our part of the world because People don't know that we have a museum. They don't know that we have a theater. Mm -hmm. Getting them to come out here and see <coughs> these things because, you know, you, you see it, you're like, I mean, I've, I'm sure you guys have all had the same experience. Anyway, you take to the museum, as again, we were talking about that. Yes. Like, I had no idea this museum. I had no idea you had this type of art here or uh, these type of exhibits and things of that nature. And that just goes to the quality of life you spoke about before. And that goes into, I think, Terrence's thing you're talking about with the, you know, economics and, and, and job growth and creation because companies look at that. They're looking at, you know, amenities and quality of life things for their potential employees. Mm -hmm. They're looking at schools. They're looking at, it all goes together. You know what I mean? And all these things kind of are all spokes in, in the wheel <coughs> um, that go together. Well, yeah. I'm going to get on my on my uh, high horse for a minute, and mm -hmm. that's the fact that, you know, you, you look at Facebook mm -hmm. and you look at social media and there's so many negative posts. Mm -hmm. And if I looked at social media, Hagerstown would be, if I believe what I saw mm -hmm. on social media, Hagerstown would be the worst place in the world to live. Washington County is not great. There's, you know, sure. all of these things. And the fact of the matter is that is so not true. We have so many things going on in this community mm -hmm. that are so beneficial and, and, do cr and do create the quality of life. Yep. And that's why I think it's important for us as constituents to be involved in the process because we do need to be worried about what the next building is and where it is. Mm -hmm. And I think the people that we entrust in, as elected officials, we need to hold them accountable for what, what is happening next because mm -hmm. they control a lot of that, whether mm -hmm. it's a warehouse or a, an expansion to the museum or sure. whatever the case may be. Okay, yeah. I'll I, step down off the I'll step on after box. you step off. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, we always talk about, I, I like to refer to Maslow theory, a hierarchy. <coughs> it's hard when I don't see my next meal to understand a five-year plan for a stadium. Sure. 
or to understand a, muse a museum and how that's going to benefit me. Though there is some indirect benefits, it's just hard to see that. Mm -hmm. So I do, think, see, I do feel some people speak out of frustration, not understanding the vision. And then I take accountability back on us. And that's why this show is amazing right now, because it's about educating people and, and having them understand that. Mm -hmm. It's not about taking money from something that could have been benefiting them to purchase something that they're not going to use, but what the whole economic benefit is going to be um, in a rising tide lifting all ships. And unfortunately, um, everyone doesn't get lifted at the same time. But if we just follow suit with what our new governor says is no one should be left behind. Mm -hmm. And when we should be making our decisions and doing it with equity. And when we have, and I look at this list, and I know we're going to hit a couple more, there is a lot to do with training and education mm -hmm. And even with the, the, merit, um, the museum project, that's a art education facility that's gonna be built out there, yeah. which is gonna be another anchor to the, um, the trail, which people, when that trail first was built, was made with that, the, the colorful wall and the rocks by, in the park, it took a lot of shots and blows as well. <laughs> and how many years past that are we right now? Sure. And now we, we got a, a vision now with probably the next two, three to four years to see what that all will kind of connect and look like. Right. Yeah. So, um, How it can all tie together. And yeah. I agree 100% with what you say. The only thing that I would add is that um, if, if for the in-between group, for the group that they can put food on the table and maybe and they have a place to live, but for that in-between group that's looking not to just survive but thrive, if they pay attention to social media and believe that this is all the further they can go in Hagerstown because Hagerstown is crap, that doesn't do us any good. And the fact of the matter is it's not true. Well, and I think it, I think it all ties together with everything you guys said of the balance, recognizing those challenges. 100%. Okay. Um, because there are challenges. There you are. Know? And, but as you said earlier, Terrence, of then having those conversations and providing that education to show, all right, we're, here's the plan, and this is how we're going to attack those challenges. And this is how, where you have someone who doesn't have the education or doesn't have the job skills or doesn't have whatever you do that's, that's holding them back right now of how these investments will provide the opportunities for them to empower themselves to then get that education, get that better job, be a homeowner. Again, it all ties together. Um, What's in so it for it, me? Yep. And, I, and I, on, on top of that, it doesn't, you know, my mother used to say, what happened in this house, stay in this house, boy, right? So you didn't put, <laughs> your, you didn't put your business in the street. Right. So when you go on social media, you're advertising sure. that everything is so bad, so bad. Who right. wants to invest? Right. Who right. wants to come you, to you, your community you're to help hurting, you? You're hurting yourself right. by saying Absolutely. that. Absolutely, right. 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 So. Uh, next on the list, we have the Robert W. Johnson Community Center that re two, uh, received $2.5 million. Sure. I mean, and Paul, you, you've been an advocate of the community center for a number of years. I remember when you were a delegate, um, you know, you, you, you wrote a letter of support when the community center was going after money uh, to revitalize the swimming pool through the commission that I served on. There's been several bond bills over the years sure. that, that, uh, um, that are now kind of being swooped into this larger project, and now you have this $2.5 million um, that's going to go towards the overall renovation and, you know, serving with the Robert W. Johnson Community Center, you know, there was an assessment for $3.2 million a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. We know where inflation is, but still $2.5 million for that community, for that historic building and that community that has lost so many of its historic assets is a huge win. No, and I appreciate that. And I think, it, to, to me, it goes back to, you know, a conversation we had, you know, previously of, I think you said it, Terrence. I don't represent just Republicans. I don't represent Dem just Democrats. I don't represent this side of town or that side of town. I was elected to represent our community. Um, and, and this particular community um, has been so often overlooked uh, and so often not invested in uh, that I have been, as you said earlier, and I appreciate you saying that, committed to uh, you know, obtaining the necessary funding and resources uh, to help uplift the community, uplift the center. Um, you know, I'd be remiss not to say that, that Senator Benson, uh, for our viewers don't know, Senator Joanne Benson, who's from the city of Hagerstown, uh, was a major influence in this as well. Uh, she's from our community. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, she went to school there. She um, absolutely did. You know, as, as a child, and she's got a lot of love and commitment um, for that community. So I had no better advocate uh, than Senator Benson when I went to Annapolis this year 
because uh, she happened to serve on Budget and Tax <coughs> Committee as well that I'm warned. She was a new member on our committee this year, but she is a, a seasoned, uh, long-time, well-respected senator uh, from Prince George's County, but her roots are in Hagerstown. Um, and so my hat is off to her for her commitment as well um, to be able to help, you know, uh, secure the, this funding. That look, you know it better than I do, but getting that pool open, uh, I think it's going to be paramount uh, to yeah. the community. Um, you know, I, I can remember even, you know, it wasn't that long ago, but even as a kid when that, that pool was open, of how much that it was just a focal point uh, for the community. Uh, and it's, it's just everything blossoms from around that. Um, and, and I'm a firm believer of what we're talking about this center, the museum, whatever. Once, once dirt starts getting moving and concrete's getting poured and things are happening, back to your thing, Jim, there are naysayers out there. There's people who are going to be negative about it. But once you can actually see it happen and you right. can feel it and you can see it, that's when I think people start to well, buy yeah. in a little bit. And the next, the, the next level of that is when people can tangibly use it. Absolutely. Right? That's what I'm saying. Well, exactly. when, when you can start taking your yep. families back to enjoy the amenities right. and it's there the in pool, the community. You can be in the center. You can use the computers. and Teens can be hired. You know, Absolutely. All, all of that. And that's, that's always but when you, you know, it, when you, when you see the action, to, to your point, mm -hmm. I think you're right. I think the, the naysayers, some of them will quiet down, not just on this project, mm -hmm. but on other projects as they see the benefit of that. You know, the ARCC, I remember when that ended, the University of Systems of Maryland at sure. Hagerstown. How many people fought not to put that, that downtown? And that was a great decision. The ARCC said, why are you buy, Why are you building this huge yeah. building? Why are you, this is duplicative, this is ridiculous, yeah. this is this. What, who, who doesn't use that, that mm -hmm. center now? I mean, they're all the indoor track meets from all the high schools. Yep. Frederick, Frederick County mm -hmm. people. Get Everything Allegheny is hosted County. here. Everything yep. is hosted here. Everything's either hosted here or when it gets to kind of the state level, it's in PG County. Right, but, but the point is, is the things here. that are hosted yeah. here, that brings money into our sure. community. It's not, you Absolutely. know, those people, they, they stay and they'll eat dinner at somewhere or they'll just drive through McDonald's or whatever the case may be, but it's feet on the street and it's an opportunity for us to say, look what we have. Now, I appreciate you saying that because I think sometimes it, it just, it, there's risk, you know what I mean? And, and, there there, and, there, and there's vision. And you're going to make bad decisions. Make, right, and those things are going to happen. The, the university system was one of my favorite ones because as, as you guys all know, and I'm sure people do at home, as I've worked uh, towards, you know, the, uh, uh, the multi-use facility downtown that's mm -hmm. currently underway. Um, it was a city council meeting one year I went into, and before I went in there, I went down to the library, broke out the old microfiche, or microfiche, whatever it's called, <laughs> yep, <laughs> and, <laughs> and went back and looked at, if you remember a segment called Mail Call, that was oh in the Mail Mail, which um, you, know, you could call up and pretty mm -hmm. much say whatever you wanted to. They changed it later on and called it Feedback. You had to put your name on it, but years ago, <laughs> you could just say whatever the heck you wanted, and they put it in there. And so I found all these snippets from when, Jim, you were talking about the university going downtown. And so I copied them, wrote them up, and I went in the council meeting and I said, hey, look, I, I just want to start off with something here. I was looking through the Herald Mail and I got some things, you know. And so I went through them. You know, why would you put this downtown? The crime, there's no place to park. You know, all these different things. And everyone thought, you know, I was talking about, you know, downtown city. I was like, no, this is from 20 years ago. Yeah. These, here are the dates. This is from the right. university downtown. Would anyone in this room argue that that was the wrong decision? Um, to put that, you know, university in our downtown. Of course, nobody would. It's been no, a, because it's, it's one of our wildly you know, anchors successful. of downtown. Now. Right. Sure. And by the way, Barbara Ingram School exactly. for the Arts is building a new generation mm -hmm. of people that are not afraid right. to go downtown because they're not going to listen to mm -hmm. the crap on social right. media because they Ringham know what happens came down there. After University of Maryland, you had the. the <laughs> so I think we go where all that's coming from. Of sometimes you got to step out and, and take a little risk. And to your the, point of risk, there mm -hmm. was a thirteenth century theologian named Thomas Aquinas, mm -hmm. and one of my He's have I here. said this? <laughs> yeah. <Have> I, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> his quote is: "If the highest aim of a captain mm -hmm. is to protect his ship, he would never leave the port." Mm -hmm. We got to take risks. Sure. Yep. You gotta put yourself out there and not be sensitive mm -hmm. about criticism. Because right. if, if you're taking a risk, you know that you're going to upset some people. Sure. And, you right. know, you can't take offense to that. Um, everyone has their opinion. You know, you want them to voice it as um, politely or constructive mm -hmm. as, as they should. But sometimes you, 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 if you're going to take the risk, you're going to have to take, yeah, yeah, it's, gonna take right. the attacks. Yeah. And, um, you know, but I did want to say you said that the community sometimes is overlooked. Mm -hmm. I did want to point out um, the best way to make sure that the community doesn't stay overlooked is bringing people over the mountain into the community. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've done that by bringing people from Annapolis so they can see the community firsthand. 
um, as well as taking community members down to Annapolis mm -hmm. to make sure they can be heard as well. As you said, pressing the flesh, building those relationships really help. And one of the biggest things you do is um, partnering and working with um, the Washington County Coalition, mm -hmm. um, which helps and lobbies and, and supports a lot of these initiatives that are on this list as mm -hmm. well. So um, it's having those relationships and you know um, knowing that uh, one man can do, can't do it all, That's right. or one woman cannot do it all, but understanding that it takes a village and working with your village of business owners as well as constituents um, in that aspect. Yeah, it's all about that collaborative approach. It's all about networking with different individuals, um, finding like-minded individuals, and maybe not even like-minded, but individuals that, that have a passion for the community. Um, again, there's many things you and I probably aren't going to agree on. Um, we have a lot of past. things. Right. <laughs> right. But I think one thing we all agree on is we right. want our community to move forward. Absolutely. Um, and, and we may have a different opinion of what that road may look like, uh, but if we can, you know, have that collaborative approach, we'll get to the end of that road in a better position than we ever would have tried to do it alone. I agree. Yeah. Hey, Jim, let me, let me explain to you how Paul lobbied for my vote. Um, North High... The Lady Hubs win the state championship in volleyball, which my daughter was a, a part of that team. Within 20 minutes of me walking out of that arena, I get a call from Paul congratulating me on that, <laughs> saying that he was going to arrange to get the girls to come down to Annapolis. And he, he held true on that. He got yep. them down there to be recognized. So he worked me over. He yeah. worked me over on that one. Well, out of sight, out of mind, right? Yeah. yeah. Anytime we can bring the North High Hub still now. <laughs> Hope for life. Uh, no, 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 no bias there. Hey, I'm not. I, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm neutral. Right up for you. I'm, I'm, I'm neutral, but um, right. yeah. our viewers may not enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I'm a former Wildcat, and as yeah. the owner of this show, I'm saying you're not coming back. <laughs> Everything well, I said nice about him, I take back. We'll get you hooked up with Senator McKay. He'll be, he'll be happy to have your, yeah, so. <laughs> but, Paul, of, of all these wins we've talked about, it, and sure. there was a few that we didn't mm -hmm. cover that received some fun, is there anything else that stands out to you that you would like to mention in regards to? Well, I mean, I think we touched on it here briefly, and I went back through just, just out of curiosity, honestly, before I came on here, because I knew we were probably going to talk about capital investments, uh, you know, in our community, whether they were straight from the capital budget or maybe capital investments were made through the operating budget, but basically the capital investments. And, and our office has been, I'm very proud to say, and it's a collaborative folks of, of not just myself, uh, but Mary Teal Medina and Liz Jones is in our office, as well as working with some of our other delegation members and, and through the coalition and everything, but our office has been directly involved, uh, like intimately involved with over $120 million in just the last three years being invested in Washington County. Um, a large chunk of that has to do with the downtown mm -hmm. uh, multi-use sports entertainment facility. Um, but what I think people don't realize with that, um, I mean, that was, that's a once in a generation win. It um, is, yes. of how that happened and how that came together. Um, and I say that not, not to be negative going forward, but I think it's just the reality of what it is of like, people see that the state of Maryland's investing 70, 80, 90 million dollars, whatever the number may be, in downtown in that project. And so they think, well, can we get a, you know, 100 million for this project or 50 million for that project? Like, it doesn't normally happen. And that's right. not just a Washington County thing, that's anywhere in Maryland. I don't care if you're the, you know, one of the highest level, I mean, President Ferguson or, or Speaker Jones, I mean, you don't see 50, 80, $100 million projects going in their districts. Um, that was a, you know, uh, all that came together at the right time with the right people in place, a true collaborative approach of, you know, I was just, you know, proud and humbled to be a small part of it, um, but all the different folks that were involved and continue to be involved in that. I mean, we all know that project has been discussed for many, many years here. 40 years. Um, the, my first year in banking, mm -hmm. we talked about that project. Right. Uh, Dick Phoebus at yep. the time came to my Kiwanis Club mm -hmm. and talked about how he was going to be a part of a group that was going to get a stadium built. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're absolutely right on all counts. And I think this is an example of how patient, how persistent, and how stubborn our our community can be relative to getting something done that should be done. And yeah. I think the timing is And the city and county are already winning, right? <coughs> because they're not on the hook for the debt service. Mm -hmm. Yep. But they're already are benefiting from the, the property assessment. Oh, yeah. Well, we talked that. about the, the residual effects off of that, of, of all those. I mean, you, you Summit Avenue, interest. right across the street from where that facility is being built, you're already seeing some of those homes being turned over and people making investments in them which yep. will increase those property values, which again, who are the biggest winners <coughs> of that? Our city and county government uh, on, on those property taxes, um, which I'm okay with because that's we need to build that tax right. base to bring in that revenue, support all the services and, and that And that, that makes it less expensive for the rest of us to So live. I tell people all the time is, is that's what's gonna keep 
our taxes down. Right. You know what I mean? Because right. if you don't have those type of investments and that significant uptick, well, then the only other option is to raise the rates. On and by the way, to another point you made earlier, which is when you start seeing dirt moved and so forth, yep. the, the naysayers quiet down. When's the last time you saw a negative comment on Facebook about the stadium? It's, it's been funny you might say, you still see some. Some, some, but not nearly at the level. And the other thing you don't see, when you see one, you don't see 300 people jumping no. onto it. I think that's that's one, and I think it is the seeing and the believing. I mean, they're still up until they actually started moving the dirt, you know, a couple months mm -hmm. ago. I mean, that bill got passed two years ago. Right. They were coming, is that really happening? That's not going to happen. Is that really right. happening? Yeah, it's happening, man. It's, 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 it's. It's, you know. I don't think a lot of people understood the process of buying the buildings and all the oh, yeah. ancillary things that right. needed to and happen to make that go. And they'll be able to watch the build it happen real time now mm -hmm. too because they're putting up the cameras on yeah. site so there'll be a time lapse yeah, of the entire cool. building yeah. the out of that. Up, a, really so cool. that's going to be amazing. I have one question for you. Sure. Um, last, well, last term say uh, you had Delicate Cham, former yeah. Delicate Cham, and this year uh, you have delegate Brooke Grossman. I do. So, you know, your delegate is kind of your right hand. Mm -hmm. You got to go in there and you got to kind of speak from the same page. But we talked about there's a party difference mm -hmm. between Republican and Democrat. How did that work this year and how do you see it going forward? So I think a lot of it comes down to a lot of the themes we've talked about already. Uh, again, I, the political makeup of this table is different. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the political makeup of myself and delegate Grossman uh, is different. Uh, I made a point right after the election to reach out to her. Uh, we sat down and had a long conversation about a variety of things. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think what came out of that, it, well, I want to know what came out of it is her passion and commitment for the city of Hagerstown is the same as equal as my passion and commitment is for the city of Hagerstown and for me, like, the broader area of the county, the district I represent. And so, again, there are certain things that she and I aren't going to agree on, and that's okay. And so we put those aside. Same conversations I've had uh, with other members of, of local government here or in other parties, uh, um, particularly, you know, our former mayor, same conversation I've had with her in the past. Of We'll put those aside, but let's focus on things we can work on together. Um, let's focus on things, because if, if we don't do that, and if we end up the next four years of, you know, trying to cut each other's throats or backstab each other or get involved in the politics of it, whatever, well, what are we doing? What, what did, what, you know, why did you run for this job? Why did I run for this? Because I told you guys earlier, I ran for this to do things for our community. I know she did as well. Um, and so we can put those differences aside and work together and do some great things for our community. Or again, you know, what, what are we doing here? I mean, we don't want to do that. I, look, I didn't get involved in this for the politics of it. Politics are part of it. That's, that's just part of what it is. And I can play the politics. And quite frankly, I think I can play them pretty well sometimes. But that's not why I got involved in this. And that's not what I want to do. And so, um, you know, I'd be interested in if you have an opportunity to have her on the show sometime to ask her that same question. But mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, we've had a, a pretty good relationship, you know, uh, in our first year, uh, trying to keep the, the communication open, um, you know, having collaborative conversations on different things. Things are important for her. Things are important, you know, to me and trying to find that, um, you know, that bridge, so to speak, of things we can coalesce on. So I think it's important. We, we have not extended an invitation to Delegate mm -hmm. Grossman. We will. Mm -hmm. We will also be extending a, an invitation to Delegate Baker mm -hmm. and also to uh, Senator McKay. So okay. we, we'd like to have as many of them sure. on as possible because they all have a perspective. Um, again, and I pointed to this early mm -hmm. in the conversation and I pointed to your Facebook, uh, your Facebook presence, and other things, your emails that you do to keep your constituency informed. You're the only, you're the only elected official that I've ever got anything this level of communication on any platform from. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that, of and uh, we 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 appreciate it. And that's why. And by the way, for our viewers, um, Senator Quarterman actually approaches us about giving updates. We don't have to go seek him <laughs> out. <laughs> so, um, he, you know, he says, I have some things to talk about, and it's not about getting you reelected. I know that. It's about, mm -hmm. here's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Come help us. Come get involved. Right. And that, that's the key. And shout out to your amazing staff. That's right. Because um, you have a great team behind yeah. you as well. That's yeah. so our legislative director, Mary Teal Medina, uh, and our chief of staff, Liz Jones. Liz has been around for a while. Many people in our community know her. She was with uh, then Delegate Shank at the time. Yep. Moved on to Senator Shank, and then she moved to Senator Senator Serafini. So uh, I inherited her. She brings a wealth of institutional knowledge. Uh, Mary Teal came on board with me when I was back in the House. Um, tremendous asset. So I appreciate you acknowledge uh, them because they they are the you know you talked about that that letter we put together. That's a, a lot of the work um, you know that, that's put in by them. So.
Well, that is all the time that we have for tonight. We hope that you'll like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and send us your comments to feedback at theflipsidetv.com. That is feedback at theflipsidetv.com. But most importantly, join us again next week for another episode of 